Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have all of you with us today. We have a lot of visitors with us and grateful for your presence. If you have yet to fill out a visit card, please be sure and do that as soon as you can. In a 2013 article in USA Today, it described the opening assembly of a new church. The writer said, quote, it looked like a typical Sunday morning at any megachurch. Several hundred, hundred people, including families with small children, packed in for more than an hour of rousing music and inspirational talk and some quiet reflection. The leader of this church is Sanderson Jones. He said, if you think about church, there's very little that's bad. It's singing awesome songs, hearing interesting talks, and thinking about improving yourself and helping other people, and doing that in a community with wonderful relationships. What part of that is not to like? Their Sunday morning assembly motto is, live better, help often, wonder more. Except it's a church of atheists. Sanderson Jones is an atheist, and the church is an atheist church, and they were trying to raise money in the de declaration in USA T Today to raise money to plant churches all over the country of these atheist church. As the article stated, the only thing missing from their entire worship was God. They were all bound by their belief and non-belief. So what's the point of church anyway? I read an interesting story about how a preacher took a poll of his friends and asked the question, what is the point of the church? He received a wide variety of responses. One person finally commented on the variety of answers saying that employees at Chick-fil-A all know the purpose of the company and that they would all have the same answer to a question about that company's purpose. The point the respondent was making was that we need to all know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the purpose of the church is and why there shouldn't be the confusion that exists. Perhaps some of the problem is that we forget that what makes who we are not a result of surveys by business-driven models to market the church to a world who largely do not understand God, understand Christ, or understand the church. And I want to say a radical thing, the church is not for the unchurched. The gospel is. The gospel is for the lost, for the carnal, and for the disobedient. But the church is for the saved, the regenerate, the redeemed, and the obedient. Even John said in 1 John, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. The monumental reality is that the world does not know God, and what the point of being a church is, is to contact who God is. It is not to engage in a never-ending business model of trying to market but trying to understand why it is that we are here because the church belongs to Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says he is the head of the body, the church. It is his body. And so that very definitive description makes the point that the church is for the church. To borrow the language of our culture. That the church is for people who are saved, who have come together for the purpose of making God the center of their lives. Now, we want to invite people who are unchurched, of course. We want them to experience the joy of worshiping the God who created the heavens, the God who has brought Jesus Christ to bring us salvation. But what we need to focus upon is understanding who we are. I'm going to pause for a second. We've had someone who passed out, and we want them to be attended to. And there's a large collection of people helping 
occur right now. So the church belongs to Jesus. And who we are should help us understand who we're supposed to be. I believe there's a valid point to make in all of this. That when the church gets reorganized to think of what its real purpose should be in the world, we get driven by things that are not biblical. And so this morning I want us to talk about what is the point anyway. Why do we exist as a church? Well, the first point, I want to come to the text of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul writes, if you'd like to read along in your Bible, But in case I am delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So when Paul writes, he understands that what the church of the living God is, is to be a pillar and support of the truth, to uphold that truth, to speak that truth. He says also to the church at Ephesus that he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man which belongs to the fullness of Christ. He'll go on to say, and as a result of this, we should no longer be those who are affected by the waves of problems and difficulties or false teaching. We should be able to feel secure and settled in our resolve that that's who we are. I want you to look at another passage that tells us something else. Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Also, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 from the easy read version, they were scattered everywhere, and in every place they went, they told people the good news. Then Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So it's clear that what Paul's trying to get us to see that the point is, is that we're supposed to be spreading the gospel. First, we uphold and speak truth, but then we try to share that gospel by spreading it. And then the third thing from the book of Ephesians. I'm sorry, I want to use this as a key verse to transition there. When Jesus says in John 15, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So what does that glory look like? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. All of this has been done to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Verse 12, to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In verse 14, who is given as a pledge, speaking of the spirit of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Chapter 2 and verse 7, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, and to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen to the praise of his glory. What's the point anyway? When we come together for the purpose of gathering, it is to spread the gospel by the preaching of it. It is to uphold and to speak truth. But the final reality of all of even those two applications is to recognize that everything, everything that was ever written about, everything that we do is for the praise of God's glory. So if we were to 
Suppose we were to write a mission statement. The Woodlands Church of Christ exists to teach the lost and to develop maturity and faith among devoted followers to our ultimate aim of glorifying God in all we do. Admittedly, these verses are not the totality of everything scripture records churches did or that churches should do. In fact, some of the statements are intentionally broad because of how expansive the responsibility that we have in our world. But the scripture still tells us that the responsibility is broader than just our assembly. It is not the congregation only that accomplishes his purpose. It is even through the power of even one, like an Ethiopian eunuch who on his way home became a Christian and by himself took the world's most powerful message to a land and a culture who would learn for the first time that Jesus is Lord. What is the point? Anyway, frankly, not even Jesus probably would, by the standards of how you and I think of mission statementology, would Jesus give us one simple, simple statement. All we can do is look throughout all of the scripture and understand this is all that God has made us to be. But I want to seize on these three points. When you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is that the one sole thing? Perhaps. But as we amp up for accomplishing in 2020 the things that we want to accomplish, how will these three things connect? To uphold the truth and speak it. In 2020, will you join us for more Bible classes? In 2020, will you engage more in our daily Bible reading. In 2020, will you equip yourself for the ministry of the work we all have a share in? You see, we've been called to be the royal people, a royal priesthood, the chosen race, the holy nation, a people for his own possession so that we can declare his excellencies. So if our goal is to uphold and speak truth, that's an instruction that's given to the church. Not the church administration, not the church leadership, and not the preacher. It's ours. It is the very thing for which the point exists. That in a world of darkness, we can proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What about in spreading the gospel? In 2020, will you take the postcards of upcoming events and hand them out to your friends and say something like, I really like you to come hear this series of Bible lessons with me? Or will you share via email, social media, and other sources and invite people in your circle of contact for this, for the praise of his glory? Spreading the gospel isn't just sitting down and reading the Bible with someone. And if we're amping up to see that we're proclaiming the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, spreading the gospel is something we all can have a part of. And then the last thing. For the praise of his glory. The word praise by itself is a powerfully evocative word. 
It is not a passive word. It's a word that explodes with sound. You don't praise something that you don't talk about. You don't praise something that you don't speak about. You don't praise something that people cannot hear. And Paul says all of this is to the praise of his glory. So in 2020, will you be unhindered in your singing? Will you belt out your praise not because you want everyone to hear how well you sing or well you think you don't sing, but to let God be the reason this morning and every morning we gather for the praise of his glory? Will you live out your life to the praise of his glory? Every day in a sanctified walk of holiness so that people will know that when they see you in your walk, they are learning every day what Jesus must have been like to the praise of his glory. What is the point anyway? Sure, we may have rousing music, inspirational talks, and some quiet reflection. But what is the point anyway? That we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're going to sing a song in just a moment, encouraging you if you want to become a Christian to make that choice today. And there's a good reason that you should. God offers salvation to anyone. His son paid the price of our sin, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And today, you don't have to be perfect. Today, you don't have to have everything right. But today, you have to decide to follow Jesus. To believe in him, repent of your sin, and be immersed into water for the forgiveness of sins, because that's what the Bible teaches. When on the day of Pentecost, Peter was asked by the audience, what shall we do when he declared him both Lord and Christ? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So for the praise of his glory, Will you not today start your walk with Christ? And if you've, stopped, if you've started your walk with Christ, then get what the point is anyway. To proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As together we stand and as we sing.